More and more people are turning their backs on their music subscriptions and rediscovering their old MP3 collection and listening to that music more intentionally on something like an iPod. And this is something I've found myself doing. I went on a kind of um, a big purge and got rid of all of my subscriptions, tried to get rid of as many subscriptions as possible. And the hardest one of all to get rid of was the Apple iCloud storage subscription, which obviously just encompasses so many areas. And I ended up replacing the uh, Apple Photo software with my own version of that. And, and that was the first kind of big app that I replaced in this Apple ecosystem to try and break free from it. And then the next thing I turned my attention to was the music system. So, you know, turning my back on a, a subscription, reinstating my old MP3 collection. And part of that was obviously just using the iPod to listen to that music more intentionally in the room where my best speakers are. But I obviously also wanted to set up some kind of fast network player that I could just easily access my entire music collection from any device on my own network. And what was striking about this was just how poor that experience is using the Apple Music app. In theory, there is this home sharing thing that lets you have one Mac running your main library and shares that to your other devices. I just could not get this to work reliably. And it's obviously very clear that this is such a low priority feature for Apple. It probably hasn't been developed for years. Uh, it just didn't work. So I wanted to improve on this and I set out to build my own network MP3 player in 2025. In this spirit of trying to break free from Apple's ecosystem, not only have I built this photo library tool uh, and my music streaming tool, I've actually also built an email application and um, taken my Zettelkasten notes fault and turned that into a kind of personal assistant that I can use a question and answer format. So it's a bit like I've actually replaced photos, Siri, notes, um, and of course the Apple Music app as well. So I'm, I'm still using a lot of the Apple software alongside all of this, but I think I'm moving in the right direction with this. And all of these tools are completely platform agnostic none of them require a Mac. So I feel like I am starting to set up a, a kind of personal software stack here. That doesn't mean I need to stay part of the Apple ecosystem. In reality, their hardware is so good. I'm kind of just quite happy with using their hardware in this more uh, personal sort of broken free from the ecosystem tight grip uh, approach. So all these tools I have vibe coded using Claude Code. And the simple reason for this is these are quite complicated bits of software now, and there's no way I'd have time to hand write this. I know there's a lot of pushback on the whole vibe coded thing you know it's not going to go away if you know what you're doing you can achieve incredible things with this i'm obviously a software developer in my day job so i i have enough understanding of what's going on to tune this and i think people fall down with vibe coding when they expect too much of it they're either seeking to trip it up and they're omitting key information that they know would help it achieve the things that it wants to do, or they just generally not quite at that level in terms of being understanding what, what it is that they're asking to do, and then it starts to go wrong. So we are still at that stage where it's really useful if you've got a software background. It's not quite at the stage where uh, you can expect to build a complex app without some prior understanding. But for simple tools like my decision analysis tool, you could do that just in the Claude prompt in a web browser and it will spit a file back. Those kinds of things, they're right there now with pretty much no uh, programming programming knowledge needed tool. So this is a very interesting tangent that we're seeing play out here. So in this video, I'm going to do a little tour of my music streaming app and sort of look at the features and some of the design ideas that I put into it. Uh, and you can use this then as sort of inspiration to build your own. Uh, if you want to follow along with the actual app that I've built, it is available to master level members of this channel. So your support is hugely appreciated if you want to jump in and actually get your hands on this version and use it as a starting point for your own work or just run with it and actually use it. Um, that's all fine. Do obviously understand the code before running it. These are kind of um, very hands-on projects. They're not polished self installed Stool apps, you know, you are running scripts on your computer. So do understand it before just running it. But the point I'm really making with this video is that these kinds of projects are fun to do. You can jump in and do this. If you have a bit of a programming background, this kind of approach is really a fun thing to do that is super empowering, it makes you realize actually we don't need to be locked into all these ecosystems and subscriptions and all of this kind of just commercial software all the time that is obviously by definition designed for the broadest possible audience when actually we can be making tools that meet our own personal requirements. And this is just such a, a more rewarding way of thinking about personal computing. And at the end of the day, is there really enough good music in the world to justify paying for a music subscription for the rest of our lives? You know, I think there's this kind of disconnect between the value proposition here. You know, by committing to a music subscription, you sort of have to decide that you're going to do it for the rest of your life, because as soon as you stop, you don't get to listen to anything. And I think this fundamental point, you know, I don't mind dipping into a subscription every now and again to sort of catch up on some new music and work out what music I might want to buy or look for a CD on eBay later and add to my permanent collection. But I think that's, you know, that's a potentially a nice way of 
looking at it. But this idea, of course, that they want you to think of using a music subscription as just one of these ongoing things that we commit to for the rest of our lives, that's just such a huge amount of money. I'm not really convinced the value proposition is there, especially as most modern music now is just AI drivel that, you know, I'm most of the music I enjoy is just old stuff that's real. I saw an incredible video, um, which I'll link to in the description of somebody demonstrating this difference between pitch corrected recordings and real life recordings. And it suddenly occurred to me just how disastrous this modern trend is uh, for music. You know, when a performer sings with musical instruments in a room, they are uh, matching the pitch to those instruments. And of course, those instruments have tiny variations. They're not dead accurate all the time, especially stringed instruments where, you know, the pitch is kind of dependent on the finger positioning and these kinds of things. And, and then what they do is they pitch correct the vocals. So then there's that disconnect between what the singer was naturally trying to do. And these are kind of tiny, minute things, but I think it just, it represented so much of what is wrong with modern music anyway. And <laughs> so all of this just reinforces this idea to me that actually there is so much value in exploring an older music library based on all the really good stuff and you don't actually have to just keep spending 15 pounds a month on these things. The first feature I'm going to look at is the visualizations. Now this is something I sort of thought I would experiment with with this app. I had this idea of just being the background being a rich visualization that moved with the music and then the interface being this floating typography based interface that sits over the top of that. Um, so the first kind of thing I did with Claude, I asked it what can we do in terms of visualization? I think this is probably one of the uh, best examples of how powerful agentic coding can be because on its first pass, it had generated me this whole range of these different visualizations that work with the web audio API and, and you know react to the music. And I just couldn't believe the amount of code that it generated to achieve this. And of course, this may be an example of this whole, like it's, it's obviously got this kind of code from somewhere. Is it theft? I mean, was it open source projects? It, it got these, the bulk of this code from how verbatim is it I don't know the answer to these questions um, but it is very very impressive to basically have a single prompt that you know, was you know make me visualizations for my music player and it come back and do this and they're great you know it's just very very fun to have this running in a web music player so part of this kind of interface convention I wanted to follow with this was this reinforcement of just a single layer of typography based UI elements that float over this visualization and, and the color scheme of the visualizations would match the album artwork and so of course when you make a design decision like that where you don't want any background fills you don't want any borders or separating lines between UI elements you have to kind of approach a few other things a bit differently so when you do need to create a separation between for example where we scroll and we pin the track that is playing at the top or the bottom of the screen we get a conflict and the, the scrolling text will go behind that text so what I do to solve that problem without creating a division and a border is just fade that text out as it goes behind the pinned version. And these kinds of things, they're, they're very interesting. I kind of like exploring these little uh, UI conventions with these kinds of tools. Now, unfortunately, because of this web audio API that this whole thing uses, it doesn't actually run on my old 2016 iPhone SE, which is a real shame. I'm probably gonna have to extend this with some sort of bridging legacy mode that runs on that older device. Uh, but for my iPad, my two laptops, um, they all run this absolutely fine. The visualizations run really well and it plays the audio really well. So my library, as I suspect is the case with many people's libraries is a collection of full albums and then sort of random singles or partial albums and the singles can have a couple of tracks and I just wanted this distinction between a full album and then everything else so I included a lot of logic into the initial indexing script so the way this works is we have an SQLite database to store all the metadata and all the indexing for these tracks so when it initially runs this it makes decisions about whether or not it's a full album you know looks at the track listing and if, if there are gaps in the numbering it will conclude that it's not a full album and then it puts it into the singles area of this app and this is brilliant in Apple Music over the years I've always kind of not liked the way that it deals with separating albums from singles you know you, you put it in the album mode you get all these lovely album artworks but some of those albums are just like one track and it it really destroys this sense of curating this collection of real albums and I wanted to really make that a strong theme here so my album view is only full and complete albums um, you know because I think there is so much value in exploring that it, again just uh, it's a good bit of pushback from this idea that we're just constantly skipping tracks, constantly seeking new or constantly being fed new tracks and just overlooking the artist's original idea of just creating an experience, you know, for 45 minutes, an album, a set, just that, that original vision gets lost with all this algorithm feed stuff pushing single tracks all the time. 
So as part of that initial import script, what it does is it extracts the album artwork from the individual files because a lot of these tracks have the artwork embedded in them. So if it exists in the track, it will extract it and it stores that in a cache folder. If the track doesn't have embedded artwork, it actually then uses the iTunes API, which is just a free and open API, no API access key needed, saves those in my cache folder as well. And then once it has all of those files, it then uses Python commands to extract the key dominant colors from that album artwork and stores that in the index database as well. And of course, that's how we can start to build this really engaging interface that has the colors change to match the album artwork uh, as you scroll through and all of these kinds of fun things. So like the other apps that I've built using this whole approach, the idea is that you run these things as Python web servers on your machine. And that exposes them you know, through a web browser on a port using your IP address. And this just works so well because not only does it actually create the interface for you on the machine you're running it on, you can access the exact same experience from any machine on your local network. And you can actually quite easily take this to a stage where you can access it from outside of your network using something like Tailscale. Or like me, if you've got a VPS somewhere, you can actually set up a reverse SSH tunnel uh, to that VPS and then set up Apache using a reverse proxy on, on there to set up the whole port thing in a secure tunnel. And it's just you know, brilliant to actually use these established mechanisms to create essentially your own cloud software applications. And it's amazing how well this works. It's just such a simple established convention. And when you compare it to how clunky and poorly implemented this network sharing feature in Apple Music is, that I just could never get to work. I tried this, you know, so set up my local library on one machine and used the home sharing to share it on the network. Just didn't work, you know. It, I just couldn't get it to reliably work. It would always have, it would always disconnect and, and then it would never reconnect or take ages to reconnect. So this is just running and I just hit the IP address with the port on the end in any browser on my network and I can access it and use it. It's that simple. It's just a, such a such a refreshing take on this. So I wanted this app to basically just be able to be run from a folder where you store the code for the app um, and it not matter where the actual MP3s were stored. So you point it at a folder when you first run it and that is the folder that it then scans. But of course, if you're running this as a Python web server from a folder, the files that the web browser can access that are running and served from that folder can't access outside of that folder. Um, but we can easily work around that just by creating sim links in there to the original files so that's how we kind of solve that and then the web application can just access those files and, and it doesn't matter where they are on your system so in addition to the albums and the singles modes, I have this playlist mode, which obviously can just display playlists. Again, keeping the separation between the singles and the albums and the playlists is just a really nice uh, way of looking at this. And you just switch between those modes. So you can create playlists in this on the fly. You can just right click on a track and add it to a playlist and you can create your own custom, obviously, playlists. Um, and that works absolutely fine. But I wanted to take this a step further. I remembered this feature from the iTunes days that was, I think it was called Genius Playlists or something. You could, you could create a playlist based off another track or, and it would just automatically generate from tracks in your library. So I wanted to do something similar using AI uh, in this. So we actually have the Claude CLI integrated into the scripts in this, and you can create a phrase, a prompt to generate a new playlist. So you can sort of ask it for you know a genre or a time period or based on an artist and so on. It will then um, compare what's in your library with a sort of list of, of what it was, thinks should uh, work with that playlist. And then it will save the ones you have as part of the playlist. So, and, and it's just amazing to have this kind of power in a small DIY tool like this. The app is also tracking play counts as well, which stores in the SQLite database. So it can maintain this most played playlist an automatic read only playlist in this area as well. And of course, because this is all indexed in this database, we have super fast, powerful searching and you can very easily quickly search for an album and it'll just come straight up and you can play it from there. And, and what's really fun about this is if you then switch it back to album mode, we can use this feature that I put in here where you hit the Q key and it will scroll to show the playing track. And this is just really brilliant because obviously we've got this fully sort of infinite scrolling based interface. It's very easy to lose the playing track. So I just introduced this key uh, press. You hit Q on the keyboard, it will scroll back to that position and that works going from search results back to the album view as well. So you can search for an album, play it, go back to the full list where you can scroll through everything, hit Q and it will scroll directly to that point. And it's just a kind of a really pleasant sort of interface convention to use. Now, I'm obviously a custom keyboard enthusiast. I don't use QWERTY anymore, but I wanted to make sure that this used Vim style navigation for next and previous tracks. So essentially left and right um, just on the keyboard there. So H and L if you're on QWERTY. So for me, I have actually slightly different mapping because I use a custom layout. So I wanted to make sure that this system lets you save your own keys for next and previous track as well. So it has that nice little feature of customization there as well. 
So this has really just been a bit of a high level overview, a look at this tool, um, just to demonstrate how fun and how powerful it is to do this kind of thing and how personal you can make these applications and tune to the way that you want it to work, but also demonstrate this concept of using local web servers um, and web-based UIs for an application that runs on any device on your own network and can very trivially be set up to work away from home as well. This whole kind of approach to very easy to make DIY tools like this, I think, is enormously empowering um, and just been such a fascinating journey as I've done this with the photo library, the email application that uses NeoVim for composing this interesting hybrid of a web-based UI for the email itself and then composing in real NeoVim uh, in, in a command line window. And then obviously making the voice-based personal assistant that works with my Zettelkasten notes vault, a super fun little project kind of just in my mind is replacing Siri, which is obviously just so hideously useless by today's standards. Uh, this is making this a more meaningful tool to me it's my own notes vault it's all the information that I want access to uh, but sort of passed through AI so that I can work with this in a simple Q&A way if you want to see more on this start with this video where I look at the unbelievable emission that Apple Photos has that led me to build my own version of that software and I'll see you there